Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. Welcome back to the Online Great Books Podcast. I'm Brett, the producer, and I am very, very excited about what is coming up over the next couple of weeks. I was very, very excited about the last couple of shows. And you might just be thinking, this sounds like the kind of thing a producer says in the intro to a show that he produces. Sure. But I remember I talked to Scott a while back and I said, you know what I would love to hear you and Carl doing on the show is talking more, whether it's books or essays, about this timeless wisdom that is so applicable to our current age. In my car, I have Will Durant's History of Philosophy CD collection, and I've been listening to these. And I keep driving around and clapping my hands and saying, this is what the world needs now. Is the world interested? No, but you probably are. And you know, whether we're talking about writing from 2,500 years ago or 150 years ago, the relevance to our current time is startling If you abstract enough to general topics and explorations, these guys already dealt with it all. So Durant's very first chapter is about Plato. But in the middle of it, he transitions kind of sharply into a brief discussion of Nietzsche along the same lines that Scott and Carl are going to cover Nietzsche today. This is the first essay from the Genealogy of Morals. I'm going to let Scott introduce it in just a second here. So I'm just sharing a personal story, saying that I was very, very excited to see the last show's Plato and these show's Nietzsche showing up as the latest additions to the online Great Books podcast, because even though I admire Will Durant greatly, and of course that is secondary to reading the material itself, which I will do in the car as soon as I am able to hire a reliable chauffeur, I will switch from CDs to books. But in the meantime, I just find it so enjoyable, and I hope you agree, to find those people that you know, like, and trust talking about these materials and these matters. So thank you so much for listening to the online Great Books Podcast. Be sure you come back next week for part two of this conversation. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the online Great Books Podcast, we are going to talk about Frederick Nietzsche on resentment. It's the first essay in his book, Genealogy of Morals. What's the name of the essay? I can't remember. Good and Evil, Good and Bad. There you go. Uh, I've been reading something for fun, Carl. No, really? Yeah, it's it's crazy. I see why people do it. (laughs) Ten Acres Enough was written in, uh, I think, 1867, 1864, there you go, by James Miller. Uh, Ten Acres Enough, A Practical Experience on How a Very Small Farm May Be Made to Keep a Very Large Family with Extensible and Profitable Experience in the Cultivation of Smaller Fruits, 8th Edition. Yeah, I I saw you recommend that. That looks interesting. I don't know that it would be a good uh, online great book show, but man, it's kind of like Walden. He has to show you all of his accounting, like where he paid Mm -hmm. 38 cents for nails. And all that kind of, you know, I love that stuff. That'd be good. I have to tell you, you already know about this, uh, but I'll tell the listeners. I harvested acorns from my very own tree, Hmm. which I planted 20 years ago. You know, they weren't that bad. (laughs) Which isn't to say they were good. No, actually, I've been going back to them. So I just did a really simple thing. So apparently every acorn is edible. So you don't need to worry about poison acorns. You just have to do a bit of work to eat them. And there were tribes in California that most of their carbohydrates were from acorns. Hmm. If you're thinking of the end of the world. And who isn't in these (laughs) trying times? The end of the world looks a little bit better if you can look at all those oak trees as a source of food rather than just a nothing, just a tree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because they sure drop a bunch of acorns. My squirrel's going to be mad because I'm going to go harvest some more, I think, today. you got to get the caps off, which was a bit of a chore, because it was a bur oak, and that has a big cap on it. Yeah, they do. You have to crack them open. That wasn't too hard, really. I used, um, I heated them in my cast iron skillet for about five minutes, and then I used a vice grip, because <laughs> I don't have a nutcracker. <laughs> so just cracking them open, Elizabeth was helping me. 
and get all the nut meat out. Now then here's the hard part, which I have to figure out a better way to do, is to leach the tannins out. The tannins are all that brown stuff that you see in a in a freshwater lake or in a um a river that makes the foam. It's kind of bitter. You need to get that out of the acorns. And that took me a while of boiling. And after that I just I didn't do anything fancy. The 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 foraging people will make flour yeah. out of their acorns and do all kinds of stuff with it. I just roasted them with a little salt and probably over roasted them, but it's good. It's actually good. Yeah, you sent a picture and they looked like really funky coffee beans. Yeah, we, we probably over roasted it. So I I had to do a seminar and I said to my eldest daughter, take these out at eight fifteen. She didn't take them out till eight forty five. Mm. So they're a little bit more roasted than I wanted them to, but wanted them to be. But they're they're still actually good. I just keep going by and grabbing a few. And it's nuts, so it's pretty high calorie for the weight. And save that runoff. We're gonna need those that tannin. We're gonna need that. What do you do with tannin? Uh tan things. I thought you used like urine. Well, that too. And iron. I didn't save it this time. Yeah, you're supposed to like have a hollow oak log that's like a hollow oak stump that's full of tannin water and you put your hide in there, you know. Ah, got it. All this hot book talk. There was a guy on YouTube on episode 89, which was Nietzsche on truth and lies in a non-moral sense. Yes. He says, sorry, but I have to say I'm quite disappointed with the show. Way too much boring small talk and not enough actual engagement with the text and its <laughs> ideas. You guys need to get straight to the stuff and cut out all of the casual living room talk, and you honestly need to do a better job in your analysis. To which I replied, I reckon you should fuck off and listen to another show then. <laughs> and then he said, you know, being like super smart and reasonable, he says, oh, oh I think I'll let this reply speak for itself. Good luck with your show. And then I said, as long as you get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and then Dan says, what a beautifully unprocessed reply. I, for one, love the show. Oh, yeah. thank you, Dan. Yeah. So listen, if you don't like all of our acorn talk and all that, go listen to uh, the Hillsdale College one about the great books. You know, it's fine. Gosh, you're certainly not the right person to listen to Nietzsche. You're gonna you're gonna get him all wrong. You're gonna you know do what people said used to say about Trump. You're gonna take him literally, right, and not seriously. And frankly, you need to do a better job with your analysis. Whatever. Well, I suppose we should get right to the book then, or can we talk more about acorns? I think we should talk more about acorns. So you got the acorns uh, the other night. I had some stuff to do. and it, like I, I can't do anything in the middle of the day. It's too hot. So mm -hmm. I don't really do anything from about noon. need to get up earlier. Noon. I, well, I get up. At, I'm out there at daylight, and then uh, by about 11 o'clock, I just can't hardly do anything else out in the sun. So from 11 till about really about 6.30 – I have to find something else to do or maybe, you know, read for the show or, or whatever. And I, about 6.30, I went out and I don't even remember what I was doing, but I went back out into the sun and uh, got to work. I came back and Charity had worked all day. She canned 27 pounds of wild plums. Excellent. And uh, burned up $18 worth of propane. <laughs> 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 hundreds, of, you know, used hundreds of dollars worth of canning jars. She canned those things up and they're... Their taste. Well, some of that expense is just front loaded. Yeah. You won't need to keep doing that. 27 pounds. And then I'm building a greenhouse, Carl. I heard. And I've got some friends at the hardware store that give me mistinted paint. So hmm. when I go in there, they're here, here, break here's some mistinted exterior paint. Why, thank you. So I had five gallons of mistinted paint. And I had like some white and some gray and a little of this and a little of that. Well, I dumped it all in a five-gallon bucket and stirred it all together, and it made this nice robin's egg color, you know? I'm like, this will do for the greenhouse. I don't, why do I care, you know? This is perfect. Mm -hmm. So I painted, and then it was time to pick the bucket up and move. I picked it up and took about three steps, and the bale on the bucket broke. Mm. And I dumped that paint out. I was so upset I didn't even cuss. I just, I just stood there <laughs> and just shook. Exterior paint is like $50 a gallon now. Like if you want to go Benjamin Moore, you're talking $80 a gallon. Inflation, it's amazing. But I, I ran to Claremore and bought a couple more gallons of paint. And I bought one of those strainer sock things, you know. 
You can put it in a five gallon bucket and strain paint through there. Then I took a scoop shovel and I scooped that <laughs> that wet paint up and uh, strained it out. And I, I I saved about two gallons of it. But oh my gosh! So my uncle Roy called while I was scooping this up. Mm-hmm. This guy that commented on that YouTube thing, he's freaking out right now. <laughs> uncle Roy called and I said, he said, "What are you doing, nephew?" I said, "Well, I you know this is what happened. I spilled this paint and blah blah blah." He said, "Yeah, education's expensive." I said, what are you talking about? Like, I've carried thousands of ga- uh, gallons of paint. I painted houses for years. You know? I can't, carried thousands of five-gallon buckets, thousands of miles. The only thing I learned here is the accidents happened. He's like, exactly. That's what you learned. <laughs> <laughs> it's frustrating. Yeah, I remember when I was in uh, grad school, one of the times I was in grad school. It's not quite as bad, but I, I had a ragu jar <laughs> of spaghetti sauce and dropped it on the floor and it was glass and it right. shattered and painted the walls with red. It was terrible. Ah. Just, but there was nothing to do but clean it up. There's nothing to do. No one else was going to do it. Couldn't save any of the sauce. Ah. But the, we've, I've determined that this color that I've gotten, well, see, I had to take a sample of that color uh-huh. and then have them actually make some of it for me. So I would have enough paint to do this. And, it, and, you know, it's no color I would have picked, right? But now I've, I'm just trying to do this on the cheap. So I'm like, well, I've got a couple of gallons, so I can get a couple more. Well, I've determined that I've determined that this is Hamburg Blue. Yeah. So Frederick is right again. <laughs> maybe he's right. What do you mean, maybe? But the thing about Nietzsche is it is so sparkly with insight that you read it and you say, how did I ever believe anything else? And it's almost too overpowering. And maybe there are reasons to believe something else, but he's so good at, at making his case that it's hard to find room. Uh, this is about, so the title is Good and Evil versus Good and Bad. And if you just stop and think about that, evil is not the same thing as bad. And once you figure that out, the rest of the essay is easier. Right. It's just easy for you. What does good mean? What does bad bad mean? And then what does evil mean? And they might actually be four different terms. There might be two goods. Moral good might be a different thing than good. Yeah. And then he, and then his other problem is what is the origin of, of these terms? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's a genealogy. It's trying to figure out the origin of the concepts, which is slightly different. So this is where I'm not quite ready to go with him. It's one thing to say these are where our concepts of good and evil come from. It's another thing to say that this is what good is. Just knowing the etymology of a word doesn't tell you the truth of it. It might tell you the usefulness of it in human history. Well, him being a language guy, a philologist. <laughs> Easy for you to say. He always takes that approach. These language people, Nietzsche, Chomsky, they're trouble. Uh, yeah. So uh, I have the Walter Kaufman translation. I'm not sure who translated the one that you used. It's Kaufman. It's the, is it? Yeah. Oh, good. I got it in that Delphi Complete Works. That's the one I'm on. Yeah. Uh, so the preface, we are unknown to ourselves, we men of knowledge, and with good reason. We have never sought ourselves. How could it happen that we should ever find ourselves? So you take the human condition. You, you haven't really thought about where everything comes from, about where all the concepts that you work with every day come from. So you're unknown to yourself. Well, he's going to try to figure it out. In the in the second part of the preface, he says, he's talking about the origin of moral prejudices. Not every, everybody thinks they know what, what's right and wrong. So much so that they won't even think about what they mean by right and wrong. And as such, you're unknown to yourself. That's the glory of Socrates. Yeah. And the annoyance of Socrates the annoyance of Socrates is that he just won't leave you with your unexamined thoughts. Nietzsche's no fan of Socrates, by the way. Uh, he's not right about everything. Uh, well, the, yeah, the problem with Socrates is that he puts too much emphasis on rationality. What do I have to do with rationality, Nietzsche might say. That's what we're going to look at uh, and try to figure out what they really mean and it might be things that you never thought of. But I want to pause on one thing here that I really liked and preface uh, paragraph two. It has this thing about the trees. Right at the end, 
and this is why you might read Nietzsche wrong if you're expecting it to be a logical treatise. We have no right to isolated acts of any kind. We may not make isolated areas or hit upon isolated truths. Rather, do our ideas, our values, our yeas and nays, our ifs and buts grow out of us with the necessity with which a tree bears fruit, related in each with an infinity in each, and evidence of one will, one health, one soil, one sun. Whether you like them, these fruits of ours? But what is that to the trees? What is that to us, to us philosophers? So the stuff that he's going to say grows out of the entirety of his thought, the entirety of his being. And if you're going to sit and nitpick, well, he doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> he says that just, it, some of this is really funny. Yeah, he doesn't care. There in the, the, towards the end of that first paragraph of three, he said, I soon learned to separate theological from moral prejudices, and I gave up looking for a supernatural origin of evil. A certain amount, this is, this is so, I laughed out loud at this, a certain amount of historical and, and philological education, to say nothing of an innate faculty of psychological discrimination par excellence, succeeded in transforming almost immediately my original, yeah, he has a, a excellent psychological discrimination faculty that he's in possession of, mm -hmm. uh, but it transformed his original problem, transformed it in, almost immediately into... Under what conditions did man invent for himself those judgments of values, good and evil? And what intrinsic value do they possess in themselves? Have they up to the present hindered or advanced human well-being? Are they a symptom of the distress, impoverishment, or degeneration of human life? Or conversely, is it in them that has manifested the fullness, the strength, and the will of life, its courage, its confidence, its future? There you go. That's what this is about. Those are the questions. Yeah, and it's uh, we tend to say, we modern people, we're the enlightened ones. Whatever our preoccupations are here in, uh, what year is it? 2021. Current year. Yeah, current year. Uh, that we, you know, that we're right, and all of those ancient people were wrong, and that it has been a line of progress from the first primordial humans to us. Well, he's raising the question. He's just asking the question. Are the concepts of good and evil, have they actually been of value to the human race. Once you figure out what their origin is, you can ask the question of their value and whether or not they're actually good. And by good, you know, have they promoted, what does he mean by good? Probably vigorous life, beautiful life. Salubrious. Yeah. This might be stuff you haven't really thought of. You know, like what use is pity? What use are negative emotions? What we, he says what we need is a critique of moral values. I do not care for pity or altruism, and neither does he. So there in, uh, where is that, section five there of the preface. He goes at them, he says, but against these very instincts, there are voiced in my soul a more, a more fundamental mistrust, a skepticism that dug ever deeper and deeper. And in this very instinct, I saw the great danger of mankind, its most sublime temptation and seduction. Seduction to what? To nothingness? In these very instincts, I saw the beginning of the end, stability, the exhaustion that gazes backwards, and the will turning against life. I realized that the morality of pity, which spread wider and wider and whose grip infected every philosopher with its disease, was the most sinister symptom of our European civilization. I realized that it was the route along which that civilization slid on its way to a new Buddhism, a European Buddhism, nihilism. Yeah. Checks out, bro. Uh, so nihilism, it's like in uh, the big Lebowski. We are nihilists, Lebowski. We believe in nothing. Uh, that's not what Nietzsche is. Uh, he is non-Christian for sure, but he is not a nihilist. What is of value is the great man. The Like Goethe is one of his examples. The aristocratic man of great will. Yeah, or even the the aesthetic great man of, of great beauty. It's not a negative thing. It's not, there's nothing. There's God is dead, there's nothing. It's, that That's not Nietzsche. Rather, God is dead, let's create something. His aristocrat, I'm going to use that over and over again here probably, but his aristocrat is not someone who wears a top hat and has a chauffeur. It's the man who says yes to the world, who creates, who sees value in himself and is a measure his own action is a measure that he takes of whether something is good or bad. Does that jive with a Nietzschean mm -hmm. aristocrat here, Carl? Oh, I think it's uh, Charlemagne. Okay. 
That would be an example. Well, that would be an example, but you don't have to be the king or any other kind of royalty to be an aristocrat. You need to, you're a man of action. You're a man who constructs. You're a man who sees good in his own action. Yeah, that's going to be the key. That There are awful lot of people who define what they are by what they're not. Right. By saying, well, I'm not that guy. I'm not one of those people of that other political party. Right. Well, no, you quit defining yourself by somebody else. You know, who are you? What is your positive good? So the the aristocratic morality that he talks about defines itself only in terms of itself. Achilles never sits around saying, well, am I doing the right thing? He sees himself as good. Yeah. And you, you may not like Achilles. That That's fine. But he's not defining himself as not Agamemnon. Right. Which is a, a different thing. I want to read a little uh, kind of extended passage from six in the preface. I think we've got even you say yours is Kaufman, but I think they're different. They must be because you were reading a while ago about the trees. So I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, so this is a, <laughs> uh, this is about the middle of six. Let us articulate this new demand. We need a critique of moral values. The value of these values themselves must first be called in question. There is no more statement of German philosophy than that. The value of values themselves must be first called into question. And for that, there is needed a knowledge of the conditions and circumstances in which they grew, under which they evolved and changed. A little bit further... One has taken the value of these values as given, as factual, as beyond all question. One has hitherto never doubted or hesitated in the slightest degree in supposing the good man to be of greater value than the evil man, of greater value in the sense of furthering the advancement and prosperity of man in general, the future man included. But what if the reverse were true? What if a symptom of regression were inherent in the good, likewise a danger, a seduction, a poison, a narcotic, through which the present was possibly living at the expense of the future? perhaps more comfortably, less dangerously, but at the same time in a meaner style, more basely, so that precisely morality would be to blame if the highest power and splendor actually possible to the type man was never in fact attained, so that precisely morality was the danger of dangers. I was playing around on, on, that, on Jack's website, not under my own name, of course, and people were arguing about whether humans now are better off than in ancient times. Cause there's a lot of anons on Twitter who, you know, like various historical ages and somebody said, yeah, but they didn't have vitamins. We're like supermen compared to them. Cause we have, you know, we're taller and we have vitamins. And that's not actually true. If you survived to adulthood, you were probably stronger back then unless, well, that's a, an open topic, but, uh, but one guy had this comment. He says, yeah, well, 125 years ago, suicide wasn't the leading cause of death. Right. Where it is, it is now. Think of all that organ meat they got. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and non-seed oils. You can look around and see, well, everything's going great. Everyone's pretty nice. Are they? Okay. But is anyone, is, is anyone, maybe, but is anyone actually great? Right. And maybe they're not. Yeah. Have we, have we had a president that was a great man? Since um, Jackson. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, but I'd say maybe Roosevelt the first. The first neocon? Yeah. I mean, he got a lot wrong, I think, but I think he was probably a great man. Yeah, probably so. A Nietzschean aristocrat. He was a man of action. He saw his action as good. Yeah. And what I mean, do you think Teddy Roosevelt would walk around with a list of people that had pissed him off? No. Or would he just laugh? No, he was he was not reacting to what others had done. He was doing what he held to be highest and best. Yeah. In Aristotle, in the Nicomachean Ethics, there is a virtue that is very hard to translate into modern terms. It's called magnanimity mm. or um, megalopsuche, I think in Greek, something like that. Big solidness. It's the virtue of the of the man who is great and knows it. We are taught, we nice modern people, that humility is a virtue. Humility is gross. Yeah, well, it's taken from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it might be a misunderstanding of the Sermon on the Mount, but I, I need to be meek. I need to be humble. I need to... Well, nobody's really humble, but... You know, I see this all the time on Instagram. Someone will be given an award and they'll say, oh, I'm humbled. Well, they're, they're no, they're not humbled. They're honored. They're magnified. Yeah. They're being honored. People throw that away around all the time when that's not what they mean. 
I think when I dump that paint, it could, no, no, wait a minute. When you drop five gallons of paint with no lid on it, where does it go? Everywhere. All, everywhere. I was Hambrick blue. <laughs> I might have been humbled. I was certainly not honored. I wasn't flattered. Uh, but that word has been perverted. So many of these, like, like McIntyre says, we can't even talk about this shit. I think biblically, it's with respect to God. It doesn't mean that the great man needs to say that he isn't. You know, if I'm picking people for my softball team, and, you know, you were an all-star player in high school, and, and I ask you, well, were you any good? And you say, no, I'm not that great. And I don't pick you. The other team picks you. And then I'm mad, you jerk. Why didn't you tell me you were any good? Because I'm humble. <sighs> Frustrating. Yeah. Uh, so great solidness, th this magnanimity, we don't have a concept of the, of the great man or the great woman for that matter. So we don't know what they ought to act like. Pascarella says that you should read of Darcy <laughs> in Pride and Prejudice because he is Aristotle's great souled man. Uh, yeah, that might be so. He's asking, is this, is this morality helpful? Essentially, right? That last passage that you read mm -hmm. 12 minutes ago or whatever it was. <laughs> Um, now he posits, and so that, that, that bumped me. I don't like that. Right. I like to think that our, our mores are helpful, but you read on a little bit longer here and he, he says that there are two sets of morality in action. You know, you'll hear people talk about the slave morality and the master morality that comes out of him. But there are people that subscribe to one of two. He's, he's simplifying maybe, right? But one of two different s schemes. I mean, he doesn't think that the, the mores of the aristocrat would have harmed society or would be harmful. Mm, well, the morals of the lion are harmful to the antelope. Maybe. So the lion, the lion hunts. And it picks off the antelopes, picks off the weak ones, and kills them, mm -hmm. and eats them. And so the antelopes might say, you mean lion, you're evil. And so maybe they get rid of the lion. And then the antelope get fat and slow. Yeah, what happens to the herd? It might be that aristocrats are somewhat like the lions which means they might be evil, according to your understanding. Is he a relativist then? Uh, no, I do not think so. Gosh, I, I love him. I don't want to go every place he goes. But he's not a relativist because he has this, the pole star of, of life itself being of value. So a relativist would say that what's right and wrong is whatever you want it to be. And uh, Nietzsche would say, I, I think he'd say it's possible to betray yourself it's possible to do something wrong yeah it's easy to to read this though and think that he might be a relativist but i think you're right he has he has higher values that he thinks need to be supported higher values i hate that i hate that word yeah values that's a big word now but it's all values what other word can we use you know what i'm talking about <sighs> ideals ideals <sighs> values the problem with values is it, it refers back to the subject, the one who values. Yeah, and it also makes it economic. Right. The morality of shopkeepers. We would want truths. We would want goods. Mm -hmm. We would want to figure out what actually is good and then value that which is good rather than making what we value be the good. If that makes any mm -hmm. sense. Value. So <laughs> Let's go to the first essay. Figure out how he does this. And for me, this is in section two, somewhere around the middle, second paragraph. Yeah. So he's always picking on the English. Apparently, the English thought that uh, 
those to whom good were done or the ones who figured out the word. He said, nope, the judgment good did not originate with those to whom goodness was shown. Rather, it was the good themselves, that is to say, the noble, powerful, high-stationed, and high-minded who felt and established themselves and their actions as good, that is, of the first rank, in contradistinction to all the low, low-minded, common, and plebeian. It was out of this pathos of distance that they first seized the right to create values and to coin names for values. What had they to do with utility? All right, so it is the nobles. It's Achilles and Agamemnon and Odysseus that are defining what's good out of their own lives. Uh, mine, mine here, my translation says the aristocrat. Not the noble, but, but mm -hmm. fine. So... What if you're in current year and the noble are only recognized as being those in the mega merchant class? Are they actually the noble? The Greek word is kalos, beautiful and fine. We just did greater hippias trying to figure out what that meant. And is the merchant class really, I mean, do they inspire awe? Well, no, but. But it is the noble, the powerful, the high station, the high minded who have felt that they themselves were good and that their actions were good. That is to say, of the first order. It was out of this pathos of distance that they first arrogated the right to create values for their own profit and to coin mm -hmm. the names of such values. So yeah. maybe, maybe uh, Gates, Musk, and et al. don't actually carry around this notion of Kalos or whatever. But if society sees them as the noble, they arrogate that right to name the virtue, to propagate the virtue, to demonstrate its utility, and so on. Well, so the way you would judge this, so this is a, a real good question. What does Nietzsche mean by the aristocrat or the, the fine people? And how would we know whether his vision is right or the Bill Gates one would be right? And I would say, I just saw a video of Bill Gates dancing at the release in 1995 of it. Windows 95. Oh, I've seen it. And he's not fine and noble. No. It does not strike me as a peak of life. And maybe that's subjective, but... No, it doesn't seem... I mean, uh, he, me either with his gynecomastia and everything. Like He doesn't seem to me the peak of life either. But what if you live in a merchant society like this with this shopkeeper's morality and you look at those and, and we look at those people as the pinnacle of success? Well, the question would be what what use is, does that is that promoting life? You see what I'm that saying? That would be how Nietzsche would judge it. Right. And then the American, like if I'm just Joe Blow the modern American, I would say, well, Mr. Nietzsche, I mean, life, like look at how many houses he's got, like. You know, he's getting to bang Grimes, and he's got money in the bank, and people listen to him. Like, I mean, what do you want? I mean, if that ain't the life, if that ain't living, I don't know what it is. Yeah. I mean, Nietzsche can't even conceive, I think, of a society that would give that noble status to a bunch of disgusting shopkeepers like that. I think what you have to look at is who the good and the evil are. <laughs> I, I, I do all the time. I'm out there painting that greenhouse. I'm like that evil son of a... <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to figure out what... Well, let's go, to, let's go to the story of the origins. Maybe there's some clues in how to approach this and the way that he does it. So uh, Nietzsche does it from etymology. Mm -hmm. So this is in section four of the first essay. The signpost to the right road was for me the question, what was the real etymological significance of the designations for good, coined in various languages? I found they all led back to the same conceptual transformation, that everywhere noble, aristocratic in the social sense is the basic concept from which good in the higher sense of with aristocratic soul, noble with a soul of higher order. Uh, it's, it's from, you can look at the words themselves, and he does some German and some Greek where, uh, Schlecht is the same as schlicht. So bad means the same. It's from the same word as simple. We have uh, a whole bunch of uh, Greek words. So kalos, meaning the beautiful, also means the noble. So that is noble, which is beautiful. So it's connected to beauty. Uh, kakos is... Kaka. 
the bad. It's like baby caca. The Latin, and this is where we get into some danger, but hang with me. The Latin melos, malice, meaning evil, is like melos, meaning dark. In Greek, so you've got the nobles who are not out in the sun all the time, and then you have the commoners who are and therefore are darker. And so uh, you get these color words that also apply to good and bad. This is etymology, by the way, not racism. Nietzsche is not what you think he is. And I was thinking about that in English, uh, where these words for good and bad come from. So he's saying they come from the aristocrats. I, I think his etymology is pretty good. Yeah, but is that the way you prove something? Well, it's, no, it's the way you show the origins of something. So think about it in English. What what are our words for bad things in English? And I was thinking of a few. Uh, lousy. Mm-hmm. He has lice all over him. I had uh, what my college roommate, his granddad, was a World War II vet and uh, was in Europe, and they would get lice. You know, like you don't get to take a bath mm-hmm. for however long, you know. And he said, I'll, I'll never forget, he, he, he didn't say lousy. He said lousy. Hmm. Yeah. Carl was his name. Well, that and makes I'm it. like, What? He's like, oh, yeah, lousy. That makes it more vivid. Yeah. We might say that something stinks. Yeah. It has a bad smell, as would the lower classes of people. When we say that something sucks, I hate that word, but I use it myself. Well, you should know what that means. Yeah. There's a reference to fellatio. Okay? It means if you say that somebody sucks, you mean that person is in a subservient position and is going to perform that act. And so if you think about these words that we have, don't they seem to make the point that our evaluative words are based on what is what the nobles are like and then what... What is base. Yeah, and so that would be the good and the bad. The good referring to uh, the beautiful people, the, the fine people, the strong people, and bad referring to those that aren't. So language reflecting on on class. I don't think it's wrong. Yeah, he talks about this a little bit later, but you know, it's chicken or egg, right? It comes from those people of that that noble class. But why are they noble, or how? Uh, well, they were the they were the powerful ones. Why? Because Achilles could knock you over the head and take all your stuff. Right. It's not an accident is what I'm what I'm getting at. So what if Jack Dorsey can hit you over the head and, and mess up your stuff? Well, I mean, I don't think the guy's noble. I've seen him. He weighs like a buck 38 and he, he looks lousy and uh, mm-hmm. he's clearly broken. Right. This is where Kalos means beautiful. OK, you can't just be beautiful by saying you are true. So there is some objectivity in determining what what the aristocratic ideal is. Jack's not, he's not fine. No. Neither's Bill Gates, you know? It, it's, uh, this is where Nietzsche's not a nihilist or a relativist. It's not merely the, the, the king of the merchants who has the most stuff. It's somebody who's actually beautiful. It says here that Jack Dorsey is five foot ten, one 165 pounds. Hmm. How much of that is beard? Beautiful at any size. I mean, also applies to tiny, tiny men. Well, you could just listen to him speak yeah. and figure out that not all is right with that, that little tiny voice that he speaks in, that monotone. Um, I'm making value judgments on Me him. Me too. But he's, you know, he's really rich, so I guess he's the best. Right. Stumble. Why doesn't anybody but me recognize that Elon Musk's brain is badly, badly broken and he's terribly handicapped? (laughs) You're a man ahead of your time. You know, everybody's like, oh, he's a genius. I'm like, really? I think I'm pretty sure he's mentally handicapped and he wants to be a spaceman. And then you all listen to him and act like he's a genius. It's, It's pretty clear to me that he's like, he's about... 11 years old and he wants to be a science man and a space man and he, and he 
he's just deluded and crazy and his brain doesn't work. Everybody's like, oh, he's a visionary. Like, well, maybe you should go to talk to Carl's 10 year old. Cause he's got some pretty awesome far out stuff to say too. Like if you're not bounded by reality or experience, I guess you can say all kinds of things and it sounds cool. If everybody's a lick spittle. <sighs> yeah. Well, all right. So now we need to talk about the priestly ideal. The priest. This is where uh, there's danger lurking in this podcast for us. So you have the nightly aristocratic value judgments, but let's go to seven. We'll just read Nietzsche and we can talk about it. It's about the second sentence. The nightly aristocratic value judgments presupposed a powerful physicality, a flourishing, abundant, even overflowing health, together with that which serves to preserve it. War, adventure, hunting, dancing, war games, and in general, all that involves vigorous, free, joyful activity. So there you go. That's the, the noble ideal that he's talking about, which right now is chronological for Nietzsche. Is it the true ideal or not? I don't know yet. But this is, this is where the words came from. The priestly noble mode evaluation presupposes, as we have seen, other things. Purity is a concept that becomes something of the priests, which isn't so much cleanliness anymore as <sighs> daintiness, maybe? Is what? Daintiness. Yeah. All right. So we have the priestly ideal, which this is where Nietzsche gets... <sighs> Nietzsche calls it the Jewish ideal, all right? Which is not, in my opinion, anti-Semitism. It is philosophy. Well, and by the way, it is philosophy. And he uh, he talks about uh, Christ as being Jewish in here. Yeah. It's a biblical attitude, a scriptural attitude. And I think that he would say that the Sermon on the Mount was... Uh, weak, slavish, subservient, garbage morality. Right. And he would lump that right in here when he says the sort of Jewish morality would come right out of, you know, the the Christ. And, it, this, and, he, and then he says here, in opposition to the aristocratic equation where good equals aristocratic, which equals beauty, which equals happy, which equals love by the gods, this dared with a terrifying logic to suggest the contrary equation, and indeed to maintain with the teeth of the most profound hatred, the hatred of weakness, this contrary equation, namely, the wretched are alone the good, the poor, the weak, the lowly are alone the good, the suffering, the needy, the sick, the loathsome are the only ones who are pious, the only ones who are blessed, for them alone is salvation. But you, on the other hand, you aristocrats, you men of power, you are to all eternity the evil, the horrible, the covetous, the insatiate, the godless. Eternally also shall you be the unblessed, the cursed, the damned. I mean, that's the Sermon on the Mount there. Sort of. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> biblical morality. Biblical morality is, I, I will imagine sometimes, for my own amusement, Achilles reading the Sermon on the Mount or Achilles reading the Prophets. Who the prophets are always saying, "Woe to you, rich! Woe to you, powerful!" Which is completely opposite of the Greek ideals. Yep. Which never say anything like that. Or the Roman ideals. Yeah, and he says this. In fact, is the is the revolt of the slaves and begins in the sphere of morals. That revolt, which has been behind it a history of two millennia. Ooh. Yeah, and whether you want to go with him on that. Maybe you, you think the Sermon on the Mount is correct, as I am bound to do. But it doesn't mean people don't get it wrong. It doesn't mean there's not this resentment around. And you should know that there has been a switch. There has been a flip. It took 50 minutes and five seconds to say resentment. <laughs> I thought I said it earlier. I didn't catch it. Uh, yeah, th there, it, there has been a switch. He says, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, he says, uh, this is, this is, you turn it back, Carl, you go back to kind of the end of five. He says, who can guarantee that the modern democracy, still more modern anarchy, and indeed that tendency to the commune, the most primitive form of society, which is now common to all of socialists in Europe, does not in its essence uh, signify a monstrous reversion. He sees this and that as a reversion and actually 
an offshoot of the idea that these these needy, these sick, these loathsome, these suffering, these poor, these weak, these lowly are the good. Those people must be served and are, in fact, your proper ruler. Yeah. There's definitely been a switch to where current events, where if you think about who is valued, it's not, in my opinion, the best of us. Yeah. It's the worst of us. I need examples. <laughs> uh, Cardi B. Yeah. Cardi B uh, was a stripper. I believe she was a prostitute. She has admitted to drugging men and robbing them. Hmm. So drugging people is some kind of crime, right? And the theft. Uh, she's barely literate, in my opinion. Uh, the music is terrible. And yet she has billions of YouTube views. Yeah. Doesn't even look good. I don't think. I'm not a real student of Cardi B's work. Mm. On our next show. Only know it in passing. <laughs> but uh, we tend to elevate the lowest among us. We value crime culture, you know? Our music is about it. Almost everything is geared to protect those who we think need protecting. And very little of it is created to provide resources to and to get out of the way of the noble, the Nietzschean noble. Mm -hmm. You know, there used to be this talk about, and kind of in conservative circles, about how uh, the government needed to you know, provide a legal structure and some resources so that the next Edison, the next Thomas Ford, uh, Th Thomas Ford, the next Henry Ford, so on, could do their thing and move mankind forward. Right? There's this sort of uh, among the conservatives. There's, there's this great man theory of history. You know that great men move history forward. Historic events are as a result of you know the actions of a few great people. The menarchist sort of political and frankly anarcho-capitalist idea is you know get out of their way so that these people can invent penicillin, the automobile, the steam engine, whatever, and then we'll all be mm -hmm. helped. It'll, the rising tide lifts all ships sort of idea. I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but stomping their guts out doesn't exactly keep the running water running. Mm -hmm. And we have flipped... We have flipped. In, uh, as a yeah, let me that. give an example. So we have uh, school districts which are getting rid of gifted programs yep. for equity, for the sake of equity. Equity is not equality. Equity is you give the short person a stool so everybody's the same height. Or you cut off, more likely, you cut off the legs of the tall person yeah. so everybody's the same height. And you have to think, and we long ago, we read a Nietzsche thing on education and he had this thought that you know, education is not for the sake of everybody. Mm -mm. Most people won't get too much out of it. The point of your whole culture and your education is so you can have a Goethe. You know, it's so you can have Shakespeare or Beethoven. I guess the other people won't do too badly, but what is the point of the human race? Is it mere existence or is it Michelangelo? See, Hambrick and Shute, I think, would believe that human existence would be better because of Michelangelo. Yeah. There is an internet guy who says that if you don't make room for and give credence to and defer to Michelangelo, then we turn into yeast. It is only life. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche calls those, I think the last men, the yeast people, uh, yeah. The Borg. You eat, you poop, you might have kids, and then you pass out and you pass away. Yeah. You, you live in the cube. You live in the pod. You eat the bugs. You don't own anything and you're happy. It doesn't say you're happy. It says you'll like it. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. It says you, and you'll like it. Well, I don't know. Like it like I like ice cream. It's not a question of happiness. It's not a. The original meaning of happiness is not feeling good. It's thriving. It's thriving. I was out collecting acorns. Okay. What happens to most acorns? A squirrel buries them and forgets about them. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's my Aristotle teacher who say, we would say, what is the talos of an acorn? And it turns out it's to be a squirrel. Because <laughs> 95% of them get eaten by squirrels. Yeah. Was well, that really the point of acorns? Is the point of acorns that oak tree? That majestic oak tree that's, you know, towering over the forest and giving shelter and food. I think it's the oak tree. Mm -hmm. Even though most of the acorns are not going to develop, almost all of them, statistically 0% rounded right. of acorns become trees. Well, uh, well, Nietzsche would probably ask, well, so you say you would rather it was the oak tree. Why exactly is that? Is it is it only wishful thinking? Can you show us that the oak tree is virtuous and that the oak, oak, the oak tree is the higher good here? Can you actually mm. can you actually show that? Um, I think it's an aesthetic appeal. I think Nietzsche is all about beauty. Yep. The truth, beauty, and goodness. You know, beauty is one of the transcendentals. I know he probably wouldn't be a fan of transcendentals, but that which is good is also beautiful. Uh, I don't want us to just be acorns. It follows from goodness. And the problem is, let's extend my analogy, if I may. Mm. If you get rid of the oak trees because, you know, they're too high for us, they're too mighty, they take up too much resources, you end up, you don't get any acorns either. You know, so you, 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 you wipe everything down, you don't have this noble morality. You might not even have any life in the end. As problematic as it might be to have the great men. I know you love that word. Let's go to section nine. So why are you talking about the nobler ideals? He's speaking. Let us stick to the facts, the people of one, or the slaves, or the mob, or the herd, or whatever you like to call them. And if this has happened through the Jews, very well. In that case, no people ever had a more world historic mission. The masters have been disposed of. The morality of the common man has won. I got to say this again, because somewhere there's some midwit right now that's just twisting off and saying he's anti-Semitic. You've got to understand. First of all, you haven't read it. If you're, if you're twisting off, you haven't read it. Second, if you've read it and you're still twisting off, you're not paying attention. He is saying Christianity is Jewish. Yes, and if you want to read Nietzsche's thoughts on anti-Semitism and why the anti-Semitism of Wagner really pissed him off, maybe you should go read that. Yeah. And by the way, he ain't wrong. Hey, a hey, hey, Nietzschean and a Christian, I have some cognitive dissonance in my <laughs> in my soul that I always need to work out. I'm not sure how successfully I have. Well, it's Nietzsche's fault, not yours. You've read more Nietzsche than I have, but I don't think he can really tell you why this beauty is good. Right, you say that there are these three transcendentals, and they're like a trinity. Right, they're aspects of each other. Right, the, mm -hmm. the beautiful is beautiful because it is good. One of the reasons that good is good is because it's true and because it is beautiful. I mean, it, it's 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 tautological, but he never really addresses that. He can see the beauty, but the the capital T true thing and the capital G good thing uh, is a swing and a miss for him. I think. No. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think... Um, so he's the one messed uh, up, Carl, not you. Yet again, one of the greats is wrong, and you're right. Well, the resentment that we're talking about in 10, you know, gosh, I've been inside the church pretty deep for a long time, and there is a lot of slave morality. Yep of squashing anything that pokes its head up. I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> on All Saints Day, I was sitting in an Episcopal church service, and the priest, it was just all slave morality, just just shitting on people of action and means. I mean, it was just pure modern politics is frankly what it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I got up and walked out of there, and they never went back. Can you read the Sermon of the Mount? And do something about the meek and so on without destroying anybody that's not that? Yeah, well, I not to get biblical on on well, I'm gonna do it yeah, anyway. Who cares? Meek. Okay, so if you read Greek, 
And you should, dear listener. It's too late, I'm old. <laughs> the word for meek is applied in the Septuagint to Moses. Okay, so meekness means being pretty much a badass who could call divine fire down on everybody, but doesn't. It doesn't mean being a nothing. Okay, and that changes things. For me, this is, I was thinking about this. Uh, we were, I was in Springfield, mm. in Missouri, for a thing. It was it was fun. It was for, it was a lot of fun. You could say what uh, it was I snuck for, out on right? Sunday. It was for Barbell Logic. Yeah, where, where you coach conference. and help people get stronger. Yep. Mm hmm. Yes, you can find us at barbell com. But I snuck out on Sunday morning to go to church because I still follow that obligation thing. And so I, I found a church. And uh, gosh, I mean, it was flat. The church was round. It's a church in the round. And the priest was kind of chummy with us and kind of fat and uh, not, you know, monotoned and, and, you know, it just was, it was just flat. Contrast that the, I, when I stepped in on the way home once from work, I, I stopped in at St. John Cantus, which is this fancy church in Chicago. And they were still at that point, I don't know what they're doing now, doing the old Latin mass. And you walk in there and uh, I was just sneaking in for a confession, one of these Catholic things that we do. But it, it, the liturgy was going on and everybody's silent and they're facing the altar and the priest is facing the altar and the altar is this high vertical trad high altar thing with gold everywhere. And, you know, the priest comes down from the high point and comes down to the people and you have this motion and it's all vertical. And I'm thinking this, this is not slave morality. Right. There's an aristocrat. It's just the aristocrat's God, which is a, a way perhaps I can, I can uh, match up my Nietzscheanism and my Christianity. What does it say? Uh, our God's a consuming fire. You know, the Lion of Judah. You know, this is like Aslan from Narnia. I'm not a tame lion. It's scary. God is, is scary. It, it, and then, but when you flatten it out, then it's slave morality and bug men and, and yeast and... And gosh, it's it's distasteful to me. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. Oh gosh, should we do ten? That's not why why nobody wants to reproduce. They don't want to give birth to a yeast. They don't want to like re bud. <laughs> well, there's no glory in it, right? You're like, oh, I'm gonna have a, a son, and he's going to sit in a cubicle to, cubicle till he's 65 years old. A one C score is going to be nine. You know, I think you're dead if it's nine. Oh, yeah, it's, okay. That's yeah, that's a measure of your blood sugar. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, is the point of life merely life, or as Nietzsche would might say, the beautiful life? You don't have to live like Achilles, but you might not want to live like Wesley Mouch. Did I get the name right? The man in Washington from Atlas Shrugged, yeah. or Ellsworth Tui? Was that his name? Yeah, Tui. What a P yeah. POS. What a completely loathsome person. Book 10. Here you go. Yeah, by the way, I, th I, I think Ayn Rand is more Nietzschean than she is Aristotelian. How about that for a thought grenade? Nietzschean? <laughs> she thinks she's doing Aristotle. I don't think she is. Yeah, I, th I think there's both there. Like, if you go, if you go read Introduction to uh, Objectivist Epistemology, it's Aristotle. And if you go read Peikoff's Opar, Objectivist philosophy of Ayn Rand, which she completely endorsed. And so that was a complete picture of her, her views and her philosophy, her metaphysics, her aesthetics, her epistemology is almost, I mean, the only thing, I mean, that's what's interesting about her, in my opinion, is the Aristotle. But when mm -hmm. it comes to her politics and her um, ethics, I think you're right. I used to have a book of her very early writing, like some of the screenplays she did for Hollywood. Yeah. They're funny. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't always an old Haradan. <laughs> oh my gosh, what's the guy's name in the Fountainhead? I just forgot his name. The architect. Rourke. Rourke. No, Rourke is uh, 
Yeah, Reardon is the the guy in Atlas Shrugged. Right. Rourke is the guy in the Fountain. Yeah, I, I yeah. think she thinks he's a great sold man, but he's Nietzschean. But she thinks that that's what's great about him. I may have discovered the secret key. Yeah, I think so. I may have discovered the secret key to Ayn Rand. We'll have to ask Marsha what she thinks. Oh, gosh. I love uh, Marsha, but she's uh, she's going to bring her boomer sensibility to it. And Oh, boy. <laughs> I know you're listening. Ten, the revolt of these slaves in morals begins in the very principle of resentment becoming creative and giving birth to values. Mic drop. Right. For the noble person. Well, what's resentment, Scott? Well, I'll just let nature tell you. He says, it is experienced by creatures who, deprived as they are of the proper outlet of action, are forced to find their compensation in an imaginary revenge. While every aristocratic morality springs from a triumphant affirmation of its own demands, the slave morality says no from the very outside, to, uh, the outset to what is outside itself, different from itself, and not itself. And this no is its creative deed. So, in Hamburg's words, resentment, sometimes you'll sit, hear people say resentiment, or resentiment, is a reaction to... Uh, nobility and beauty. Yeah, you define yourself by what you aren't. I'm not like those people. Um, or you tear down those that are better than you. That's a better is a loaded term. That's actually it. You're forced to find their compensation in an imaginary revenge. Eventually, it becomes an actual revenge. Yeah. The slave morality requires as the condition of its existence an external and objective world to employ physiological terminology. It requires objective stimuli to be capable of action at all. Its action is fundamentally a reaction. The contrary is the case when we come to the noble system of values. It acts and grows spontaneously. Those who act out of resentment are constantly reacting. They can't create they only react. Uh, I think you can see this, dear listener, uh, very evident in the meme world. I have to describe memes with words. In the Soyjack memes. Wojak. Oh, Soyjack. Yeah. Okay. Wojak, Soyjack, of people who look at those who are doing good things, noble things, and say, well, actually, you know, you're not doing well. Or in the acceptance movements. Mm-hmm. To accept, you know, various unhealthy physical states and say, no, actually, it's beautiful. I'm more beautiful than you are. No, you're not. You're actually not doing very well and you're at risk for diabetes. CNN, healthy 40-year-old COVID victims' last words. I blame the unvaccinated for this. And then there's a photo. Are you sure that story's real? Are you sure that story's real? Let me check. That's a good idea. Let me check. Did you see it? Did you see it? I've seen it. It it's too on the nose. I bet I, I bet it is. I hope it's not now. But let's see. This is good pod. Yeah, it is. Let's see. Now now I can't find it, which doesn't mean that it's not real, but I can't find it. They do have a picture that says these yeah. these are the faces of some of the US coronavirus victims and there's a bunch of gray headed people and obese people. <laughs> But, you know, healthy at any size. It's fine. This is more political than I want to get, usually. Okay? Uh, but if you if you scroll through TikTok, which I don't, but they show up on my Telegram channels, the people who are declaring themselves to be the good now, they generally don't just show themselves and themselves th- thriving. What they'll do is say how they're not this other thing. They're not, for example, they're not your stereotypical gender roles. We're not like you people who just follow the, the roles that you were given. We're choosing our own. It's smacks of resentment to me. I, I think there's a whole lot of this going on right now. Is that a hot take? I mean, isn't that obvious? Is, isn't it obvious to even someone of the progressive left that it's a reaction to what has been. Isn't that obvious? Well, I, let, I mean, look at the notion of progress. The progressive 
is always defined as not that. Right? I think the concept itself is resentment. Mm -hmm. If you try to pin down your, your progressive friends, when would we end progress? You don't ever get a conceptual picture of it. You just get, when we're not like this and not like that and not like that. Uh, it's not a happiness defined in itself. I'm going to read a bit. This is a little further on in section 10. Well, before you read that, in trying to find that story, which I couldn't find, it, must, it may be bogus. It must be bogus. I don't know. I see that Kristen Stewart will be playing Princess Diana in the movie called Spencer. <laughs> Are we going to read Twilight? I certainly don't want to. Isn't she the one that was in that? Maybe. I don't want to read that. <laughs> Go read your chunk. Oh, gosh. I want to hear your theories. Your sister is so bad. Okay. So the well-born felt themselves to be the happy. They did not have to establish their happiness artificially by examining their enemies or to persuade themselves, deceive themselves that they were happy, as all men of resentment are in the habit of doing. Let me pause right there. I mean, I saw this interview with this uh, comedian. Oh, what's her name? We talked about it in a previous show. The, oh, she was in School of Rock. She did the voice for Wreck-It Ralph. Sir Silverman. Oh, okay, Sir Silverman. Super funny. Yeah. Super funny. Uh, very offensive. But I've loved much of her work. And... I saw this podcast she did, this video podcast she did, where she's talking about her choice not to have children and and talking about her her childhood. And she was actually molested as a child when she was off in school. But she's telling us all how happy she is. And you look at her eyes and you just want to cry and give her a hug and, and say, it'll be okay, Sarah. She's not happy. And she's perceiving herself, or she's persuading herself that she's uh, happy. Who is Carl to tell her she's not happy, you know, by your standards, but, you know, she loves avocado toast and waking up with no one in her house. Oh, but gosh, if you could see her eyes. Of course. Eyes like a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> right. <sighs> yeah. So th this concept of, of the morality of resentment, once you read Nietzsche on this, you're going to see it everywhere. Yeah.